clock. <clears throat> I'd like to call this public hearing on the proposed local law number three of 2020 Ag Events Law uh, on December 8th, 2020 to be open. Uh, audience participation is allowed. Uh, so we'll have to do attendant. Everything's by roll call, so just so the audience knows it. So to establish the quorum, Oberly here, Councilwoman Cunningham. Here. Councilman Giuliano. Here. Councilman Dean Michael. Here. Councilman Witten. Here. Town Clerk Mackin. Here. Everyone's present, so mm -hmm. we have a quorum. We can officially hold a meeting. Um, town Clerk will read the public hearing notice. Please take notice that the Town of Clinton will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, December 8th, 2020 via Zoom video conference, consistent with Executive Orders 202.1 and 202.15 as extended, addressing the COVID-19 virus at 6 o'clock p.m. prevailing time, or as soon thereafter as the matter is reached on the agenda concerning proposed local law number three of 2020 titled Agricultural Events Law pursuant to Article 16 of New York Town Law. Please take further notice due to public health concerns, in-person attendance will not be permitted. However, the public will be fully able to observe and participate in the public hearing via computer, smartphone, tablet, or other electronic device. The public is invited to attend the public hearing held via Zoom video conference and comment on the proposed local law. Members of the public who wish to comment may do so by joining via Zoom. The passcodes will be published on the Town of Clinton website, townofclinton.com, which will enable the public to participate in the meeting. The codes can also be retrieved by emailing Town Clerk Karen Mackin at townclerk at townofclinton.com. Comments for the public hearing can also be submitted in advance of the public hearing by sending an email to townclerk at townofclinton.com. The local law will take effect immediately upon filing with the Secretary of State. Complete copies of the proposed local law are available at townofclinton.com and at the Town of Clinton Clerk's Office for inspection during regular business hours. All interested persons and citizens shall have an opportunity to be heard on said proposal at the date, time, and place aforesaid. Okay. Let, let everybody in. What? I let the public in? Yeah, you can let the public in. Okay. All in? Okay, at this time I open the floor for public comments and turn the meeting over to Councilman Michael, who will ask for comments from the public and the town clerk will record whatever facts are presented. So at this time, uh, Dean, take over. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, Jeff, are you on? I don't see Jeff's on, but. Uh, yeah, Jeff is there. Is he? Yeah. Jeff, I don't know if you wanted to read your, uh, your comment that you uh, emailed me. Jeff's muted. Thanks. I, I'm used to the Zoom thing. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dean. I let me pull that up. Uh, so while you're doing that, just so everybody knows, um, Shane had only just sent out, um, even though everything was updated back in uh, February. Um, uh, with the comments from the last meeting, uh, Shane made updates. Um, and we had kind of a verbal from uh, Dutchess County Planning, but we never got, uh, we never sent them officially uh, the document because that was around the time that everything got shut down. So, so uh, Shane had only just sent it to to them. So they, they do have 30 days, so we can't take a vote on it tonight um, um, because we need to wait for Dutchess County uh, Planning for 30 days. So. Um, so, and we haven't gotten a comment back, so, but, uh, Jeff, if you're, 
Okay. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you, Dean. Go ahead. Um, do you want me to, to include the part about the, the conference center? Uh, whatever you think is appropriate. Um, I mean, so, so just so everybody knows, um, there's this is kind of like a, a two phase process because currently we already have current law on the books for a conference center, uh, which uh, the Duchess is uh, the only one that has that that uh, permit. Um, so someone could actually go in and get a, a conference center permit. Um, what this does is um, it separates ag events and conference centers. Um, and because we are separating them, we do need to modify um, that language in that conference center law. So um, uh, we, do, we did plan on, uh, well, we have the changes. Um, so we can talk about it tonight, but it'll be a, a public hearing for uh, next month. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. That was what I, it sort of hit me this morning when I was reading the, the latest version. Um, and like I said to Dean, I think this is the best version yet. So congratulations for, for all the work to get to this point. Um, uh, but that was something that I noticed was that since everything falls under the new 250-45.1, it only applies specifically to um, agricultural event venues. So someone could conceivably apply as a conference center and circumvent the more strict rules that are being put in place and under the agricultural events venues. But um, given what Dean just explained, then um, for the conference center to also be reviewed, uh, and I would imagine some of these then would be applied to that and I look forward to, to hearing that. So I'm glad that that's in the works. Um, and then the other um, specific comment, and I, and I do have some things, um, uh, uh, just most housekeeping stuff, but the other specific comment was again related to the amplified sound. Um, uh, currently it says um, all sources of amplified sound including but not limited to music performances and spoken words shall be contained entirely within an enclosed structure. And um, uh, one of the things that, um, that sticks with me through this whole process is we got here because of the desire to create, to, to give better enforcement tools to the town and um, so in an instance like this, where it, it's a technicality, I understand, but um, a cell phone ringing, for example, or a cell phone being used to play, play music is an amplified sound. Um, so it makes it almost unenforceable by commonality. Uh, and if what we're trying to do is to create um, better tools for enforcement, then it seems to me to make more sense to word it something like this all sources of amplified sound intended as part of the event, including but not limited to music performance and spoken words shall be contained entirely within the event area. And then eliminate the sentence that, that follows that um, it, it, regarding buildings and structures. Uh, and what that does is it means that any source of amplification has to be contained within the event area. And later in the same paragraph, it refers to the, um, the, the town um, noise ordinance. So everything is covered in there. Um, I just think that cleans it up and makes it um, more easily enforced. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. And I know Rebecca, you had just sent over an email and I hadn't gotten a chance to, to read the whole thing, even though it's not that long, but I did briefly uh, skim through it. So if you wanna make your comment. Uh, thank you, Councilman Michael. Um, my comments are brief. Um, I will second the uh, comments that this law has come a long way. I really appreciate the town board's efforts and responsiveness to our previous comments. Um, my additional comments are really limited to the section of the law that addresses the renewal and review of the special use permit. We very much appreciate that it's no longer subject to an annual application. Um, it is, though, still subject to an annual submission by the zoning administrator. And then the language states that the planning board shall have the discretion to amend or revoke the special use permit based upon the findings of its annual review and may, in its discretion, hold a public hearing prior to taking any action. Uh, it is the discretionary portion that I, I'm commenting on is case law supports that a municipal board's decision to revoke the special <laughs> permit cannot be arbitrary capricious or capricious, must be supported by substantial evidence, and you have to abide by certain procedural formalities, one of those being notice to the interested parties 
and a public hearing as supported by case law out of Westchester County. In addition, we just note that revocation is not appropriate when it would be unduly harsh in relation to the alleged violation and shocking to one's sense of fairness. So we respectfully submit that the language quoted in my letter should be revised to provide that a public hearing on notice to all interested parties only if the planning board finds that the zoning administrator's report raises grounds for potential amendment or revocation. If the zoning administrator's report does not raise any alleged violations, the review should be complete at that time. However, if the planning board does intend to amend or potentially revoke the permit, the holder is entitled to notice and an opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I it all sounds fair. I mean, in the sense that the, whole, the only reason for the review process was to to hear comments from the neighbors or any other interested party for any violations, whether it be excessive noise or continued issues. Um, and, and so it allows for an opportunity for um, town residents to have that, that ability to either fix remedy or get rid of um, the event uh, you know, center itself. Yes, and, and I understand that and comments aren't necessarily haven't come from this board, but during the course of these public hearings that I've attended, there has been some interest in if there's a violation, pull a permit, you know, revoke it. And we just want to make clear that the holder of the permit does have the opportunity con to contest any allegations made of violations. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, Anyone else have comments or? Uh, a few, just a few housekeeping things in terms of um, uh, a couple of words here or there. I um, want that at this time or sometime later. Oh, you can give them to me now since no one else has comment. Okay. Uh, so I'll just go um, page by page. Um, uh, um, I, I like the definitions and um, appreciate um, the use of capitalization, which I know we've discussed in the past. Um, it, it mentions farm and when farm is capitalized. Since we're referring um, predominantly to egg and markets law, um, I would recommend wherever capital farm appears that it's followed by the word capital operation, capital O operation, um, to better be in line with the um, usage that egg and markets uses. Um, uh, I'm going to make that definition more clear. Um, on page one, event area, um, just a, a, a typo, the location designated on an approved site plan. Um, sorry, let me make, make, make sure I did this note. You said that was oh, under yeah. event? Yeah, so under the, the definition of event area, um, it, since the definitions aren't part of 45.1 and would apply uh, wholly throughout the town code, um, I would recommend making the change um, uh, the, to the location designated on an approved site plan and removing of an agricultural event venue. So it applies to all site plans. Since that's, again, that the definitions would be in section 105. Okay. Um, page two at the very bottom, C sub three, uh, capitalized farm operations. Uh, oh, sorry, above that, uh, C sub one, um, there's an S after event. So again, just for consistency, agricultural event venue. Um, uh, next page three, um, subsection four, uh, it's, it says lots or lots, but it should be lot. So there's an extra S in the first one. Uh, in subsection five, um, uh, there's still um, in the town a specific form to be used, the authorization of use form. So, um, right, um, if that's the case, and I would recommend referencing that in subsection five, um, as opposed to just a written authorization. Again, just for consistency. Um, same page three, uh, D, uh, D3. Um, uh, there's a comma missing New York State Uniform Building Code comma as amended comma should be there. Uh, page four at the top, um, it says form should be from. 
same paragraph, second to last line, same typo and set of form should be from. Uh, next paragraph, section five, um, about halfway through, it says um, produced on the farm operation during the previous year and how the intends on marketing its crops to livestock. So it seems like there's something missing there. Um, maybe it was farm operation, um, but there should be something between the and intends. Um, I already went through the bottom of that page. Um, I kind of went there. Um, page five, section nine, um, second line, shall be solely for the use by event attendees. Um, I would recommend dropping the, um, so it's just for use by event attendees and staff. Um, bottom of the page, section 12, um, uh, now that I understand about the um, Dude Ranch also being addressed, conference centers and Dude Ranch are being addressed separately, um, I had the question of do we want to pull out the, sec the, the uh, inter inter interjection that says, and any special use permit issued to an existing Dude Ranch as previously defined by the town code, uh, and move that over to the new revision of Dude Ranch, um, predominantly because it's the only place in this entire section that refers to Dude Ranch. Um, uh, Page six, um, similar to what Rebecca um, had, had said, um, I really am happy to see that it's a review process. Um, in the change there, it just looks like um, there were some other renewal words that were not changed. Um, so for example, in 14 under fee, an annual fee due at initial approval and then upon each annual renewal. Well, if the um, special use permit isn't renewed, but it's an annual fee, then maybe it's upon each anniversary of the special use permit. Um, same thing in the next um, 15 non-compliance, um, second line, including without limitation, the failure to renew the special use instead of renew the failure to submit the annual fee for the special use permit on time. Uh, section 17, um, uh, health department um, approvals, um, swimming pools, and public water supplied um, should be public water supplies, uh, or or public water supply. Singular is probably fine too. But um, uh, and again, there's an S on events, uh, and that was it. Okay. Thanks for letting me go through that. Okay. All right. Anybody else have comments? Arlene, you need to unmute. Arlene, are you saying something? Hold on, sorry. How's that? Sorry. Sure. Just questions. Um, sorry, Dean, I didn't get the chance to send you a comment. So how do we how do we differentiate this from those people who Let's say they just want to have a wedding event. So I understand it says you have they have to use their own products and it's an ag event. So I guess anybody, I guess this is different from the ag events than the regular people who just want to have a wedding venues or using the farm exemption to have an event, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone's using, you just read the definition, which is agricultural ven venue. If you, if yeah, you, and you have the, if, yeah, you have an event, then you have the agricultural event venue. Yeah. Right. So. It, it specifically says for hire um, mm -hmm. as a location for events. So if you're just having a, a wedding that's not for hire uh, at your house, that doesn't apply. Yes, and it's commercial. Okay. On, on another note. Like going back, we have this huge uh, thing about on field road, right? Because so, since now it, it doesn't restrict with the uh, town road or the county road, like field road, there is one property over there that the whole neighbors are totally against because field road is a one lane road and, you know, it's congested. So they will be, they, with this regulations, they'll be able to qualify, right? Yeah, we, we went right around about the uh, the road and whether county or connector or any other languages that we we're using before. So this is this is the product after going through all that. I'm sorry, taking advantage. Um, 
also going back, we were talking about limiting the number of events. With these regulations, they could have as many as they want. Going back, we we're trying to limit like six a year. With this one, they could have as many as they want. Mm -hmm. That was another thing that was in several drafts that uh, changed over the over the course of time. But um, you know, it was uh, so ag markets, the county planning, um, everybody that's put input uh, basically said, if this is truly a farm event, um, you can't limit farms from having events. And another thing, since they could have wedding or weddings or sweet 16, whatever that is, of course, they're gonna have, they're gonna be serving alcohol. Is that included with that verbiage about the food and the beverage? So they're okay to serve alcohol, right? Well, anybody that serves alcohol has to have a license. Yes, but we're talking about how is it gonna impact about traffic, drunk drivers, people driving in and out, health hazard, safety. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the question or I'm missing the- Well, you're right. I, 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 I understand we talked about all these different things, but you know, whether, um, you know, the, the fact is that, um, you know, the, the wineries, the two wineries that we have, um, or whether it be Adrian's, uh, um, old Adrian's farm that actually produces Himalaya. a beer product, um, have a, a, a farm producing license. Um, so, uh, you know, we, I, I, I just don't know how to answer your question. I know what your question is, but it's, it's you know, how do you stop, how do you stop anybody from drinking and driving on the road? I mean, it's- oh, Yeah, yeah, I guess, my, I guess it's more of a impact and safety measures, you know, to the if, public. If, if, if I can jump in, um, in on page five where it talks about food and beverage service, um, it says food ser service and beverage providers shall hold and shall produce upon demand all required permits and licenses. Um, and so for someone to serve alcohol legally in the state, they would have to have, as Dean mentioned, a um, license from the New York State Liquor Authority, even if it was a temporary one day license. Mm -hmm. And in order to obtain that license, one of the things that the, the, the applicant must agree to is enforcing all New York State laws around consumption and control of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so that the license holder becomes fully responsible for anybody who is uh, over intoxicated or anybody who drinks and drives from the property. So all that sort of built into New York state laws, which this references, it could be more specific by actually calling out um, a, a New York state liquor license in um, paragraph nine there. Um, but I think, I think it essentially does cover it that way. Yeah, and that, that's really the bottom line, whether it was a, a bar or a restaurant, or those businesses are responsible for mm -hmm. anybody that leaves their property, so. And, um, sorry, um, another, with regards to the sound to the music or whatever noise, can we can we put on the regulations about how about putting soundproofing the, the building, you know, not just you know it we, we we're talked about that and 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 I think Jeff you even made comments about it in, in several of the meetings. It would be impractical to soundproof a whole barn. And, and yeah, that's true. And, and while that would be the ideal situation, and I'm actually, I'm actually a big fan of that. I, I, I think everything should be soundproof, but I don't think it's practical. I think that, that the control there is in the, um, the noise ordinance, uh, which is in a different section, and that the noise ordinance is um, clearly spelled out through the process and the planning board is clear with the applicants that this is going to be enforced and then that there is an enforcement model for the town to actually stay on that, because I think that really is an issue. In, in practical with regards to to the cost or to the um, the uh, construction on the barn, um, largely because of the cost, and also um, a lot of the events and, and are held in tents, which is um, allowed by earlier parts of the law. So a tent wouldn't be um, able to be soundproof, or if it was fully outdoors. Well, I think the cost factor is, is going to be out of the question. They're going to be making money for this events. I 
I assume. Um, just that you can't soundproof something that it's totally soundproof. And so, again, we we went through this for the last two years, um, talking about the different measures and everything else. The bottom line is that we have a noise ordinance. So whether it's soundproof or it's not soundproof, there's still you a noise ordinance that's your, uh, yeah. supposed to override everything. All right. Um, what's my last question? What's the last question. Um, so it's renewable, right? So the um, procedural pro process, they have to go to uh, the planning board. Um, so it's like a special permit. It, um, it's good. Do they have to renew it every year or like special permit expires in, uh, I mean, special it's permit, yearly. once they have it, they have it. So it's they you don't have it. Do it exactly with this one. Do we have to look at it again and renew it? Well, it's up to you know the code enforcement officer to determine whether there was any Changes. significant you know uh, issues that uh, were reported over the year and whether they were remedied over the the course of the year. And the ten acres, it's <laughs> they have. Anybody who has 10 acres and they are in the ag district and a farm can apply. And of course, using their own products, right? Could qualify. Well, we talk about 25. I know um, the Dutch is kind of like overruled that. We had 50 acres, we had 25 acres and, yeah. you know, Dutch County planning poo pooed anything. It, it and, and, you know, whether it's a farm and, you know, there's limitations as to income that, that has to be produced versus the revenues that you get from non-farm activities. So there is that limitation that, it, you know, a small 10 acre farm is not gonna produce enough revenues to offset to have this exemption. And that brings up another um, uh, thing as far as the limits um, that Arlene, you had mentioned um, that there used, used to be in the law, you know, a certain number of events per year. Um, in terms of agricultural events, um, they're already limited by New York State Ag and Markets Law that the revenue from a farm operations event operation cannot exceed 30% of their total revenue. So that's yes. the measure. So somebody can't be doing 10 weddings at $15,000 a piece if they're not producing $450,000 in their farm. And do we have to spell that out on this regulations that they should comply with uh, the well, ag and Belt and ag markets. I mean, it's it's already in there. All right. And last, going back, we talk about proposing this law. We're going to eliminate uh, the dude ranch. So we're not. So dude ranch is still <laughs> going to be in our regs. Well, because we already have one on the books, until it changes from not being on the books, we have to still have a law for it. You're talking about the zoning revision or with this thing, is it, I mean, do we still have that dude ranch? This is a, is a conference center dude ranch. I mean, it's, you know, so in, in, unless they get rid of their designation, we have to have a law that addresses it. If they give up their designation and we want to get rid of that from being in the town, we can certainly remove from the zoning. But, you know, that's why we're changing the language to fix some of the differences between the conference center and, and or, I mean, the event center and the, uh, the conference center. Like like the uh, Duchess DLC, uh, LLC, the Duchess LLC with Jeff. So right now they have a, a special permit for a dude ranch. So if, do they still have to apply for a permit for this one or? They don't have to. If they, they originally Jeff had mentioned that they were going to, but they don't have to because they're going to be automatically qualified. Well, they're grandfathered to having it anyway, so it's... Well, that grandfather is not spelled out in this regulations, are they? Well, or there's is... only one, so, and, and we're keeping the law. Yeah, yeah no, so it, I... it isn't even a matter of, of it being grandfathered, it's that the law still exists. And so, so the Duchess would still be able to operate with a special use permit. But the, um, I think um, the changes that were made um, in the agricultural event venue law that we're talking about that are much better drawn out and laid out and much more protective 
um, than the existing um, section that describes conference centers and dude ranches. Uh, if, if, as Dean said earlier, the, the, the next step is to add similar language to the existing conference center dude ranch section, then I think it answers a lot of those things and, and both can coexist. Um, you know, it, it, I think we answer it that way because I think it is important. I think these are really important things. Can we define um, grandfathered? What do we mean by grandfathered? Or, or I mean, like the, the, the dude ranch, they have a special permit as a dude ranch. What about all those other people who are operating without our knowledge? That if they're operating is, illegal, they don't get any. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Grandfather. They're not grandfathered. We just want to make sure that those two things, you know, some people will say, well, we're grandfathered. We've been doing this for a while. So those are two different things. So uh, I just don't know if we have to really spell that out in the language of uh, uh, the regs. You know better, Arlene. I'm, I'm looking for this. Oh, I know that, but you know, you know better. That, that doesn't, that doesn't exempt you from, from following the rules. Just because you've been breaking the law for 20 years doesn't give you an exemption. That's true, that's true. And I always argue with that with them, but you know, like, where are we sitting the regulation? So anyway, that's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? So, as I, as I mentioned, uh, we can't pass this uh, this law tonight, uh, only for the fact that we haven't gotten the uh, the approval from uh, Dutchess County Planning. So they have this this version, but I'll, I'll update these uh, several comments and and this way uh, by the next meeting we'll still have to hold another uh, uh, public hearing. So I guess we should leave the public hearing open. You don't need another public hearing no. necessarily. Well, okay. not necessarily. Okay. So if everybody's satisfied with that, then we'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Hey, so Dean, yeah. Dean, I'm new, I'm new to all this. Okay. Um, and I'm pretty proud of myself that I'm on Zoom here. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna take pictures of it and show my kids I can do this. Um, right there. Is this? Let me see where I can get over. I'll get over here. So, do you're closing the public hearing? So, or, or is our voice turned off, or is this when you want us to address you? Oh, this is when I want you to address me. Well, there yeah, you go. So, well, I'm not used. Yeah, this is a different yeah, venue for all of us. I'm used to there being a dais. So, um, then let me introduce myself quickly and hit on some of the points and some of the concerns that I and one of the other adjoining neighbors have. So first, some of you know me. Um, I've been a business owner in Dutchess County for 42 years. I've been a resident of Statsburg for 61 plus years. I know I look really good. I look better on camera. Um, and I've been a Creek Road resident, resident for 30 years. So my property is pristine. I border the eastern boundary of the old Adrian's farm. Um, between Creek Road and Route 9G. Um, my family has owned the four acres up to recently where another person re renovated and I was instrumental in the landscaping of that property. So the four acres where I live along with my neighbor, pristine, there's not a leaf on the ground. Uh, I'm ready to also undertake now a big rehabilitation of my, my pond property. The across the street neighbor, he will speak soon um, I tend to be maybe a little bit more wordy than he. Um, Justin Wisniewski also has a very pristine property. We're out there day and night trying to enjoy and trying to create a way of life for our families. Being a business owner, I want to see the farm succeed. But, also, but by being a resident, I want to see the farm succeed and not take away from a way of life that we've grown accustomed to. We live on Creek Road in Clinton because we enjoy the quiet, the peacefulness, uh, the serenity of it. We have friends that come and sit by my pond and they never want to leave. So when I have to start raising my voice at my picnic table to talk to my mom down at the other end, and it's not that she's 86, something needs to be addressed. So when I saw that it had to be any loud ordinance of noise had to be kept encapsulated in a building, I kind of did a yeehaw and a little bit of a skip. 
I do agree that that's not practical. You know, you do have to sit outside. Um, I think some of the main talking points we have, or I have at least, um, one would be the, the, the just the hazardous road, road conditions. That arguably is one of the worst roads that we have in our, in our county. Um, they use it as a bypass road to get over to Route 9G instead of coming down to the four corners. It's the worst corner in, other than the S turns above Toad Hall. We have young people regulating traffic to and fro. This is during a pandemic season. We're scared to death what's gonna happen non-pandemic here. And again, this is nothing against any of the owners of the farm. We're all for it, but we've got to do this and do it safely. The cars in the traffic, just unacceptable. The, the rate of speed and the amount, the volume of traffic on there. And it's not, it's a weekend venue. Now we're doing almost a weekly, every day venue. So we're subject to this throughout our entire season. I have a beautiful pond, beautiful pool. I can't sit outside and enjoy that. My other would be the signage. Um, most townships have regulations on signs. Um, there's signs screwing up and down the highway. There's banner signs, which in most towns are illegal. Um, we've got them everywhere. Lighting is another that I see addressed in there. We have spotlights that are, I see that there's a lighting plan that's supposed to be sent in and approved. We've got an extension ladder with a clip on light as a parking lot ladder next to some really beautiful properties. It just, we want some of this stuff addressed. And then of course, on top of it all is just the noise, the noise. We need to do something to keep the noise level where it's, it's acceptable for everybody. We're, we're Sam and her mom, Stacy can make a living. Absolutely. But we're Justin and I don't have to go inside because we can't stand the noise and the ruckus and the cars any longer. So again, we, we, we've got pristine properties. We've got a nice way of life. We're just trying to maintain that way of life. So help, help. Those are my talking points. Um, and those are my concerns. I don't drink alcohol, so I don't want people on my road drunk either, but that's besides the point. Um, so those are my talking points. Justin Wisniewski is also on here. Maybe Justin wants to pipe in before you close out the public hearing. I do have one final note though. I did not get, um, um, I didn't, I wasn't told that this meeting was taking place tonight. What is the typical um, procedure for informing local landowners? Well, First of all, we have a, a uh, notification system where if you register your email, um, not that this particular event was, was emailed out to everybody, but the first thing I would encourage you is to register for email notices. Um, okay. Our planning um, process, um, you know, typically, whether it be a zoning issue or a planning issue, uh, sends out notices. Um, to whether it be the paper or um, so all public hearings have to be notified um, to those sources of uh, which Carol uh, sends out the notices. Um, so there was a notice sent out to it. Um, I'm just used to the old certified mail technique. Yeah, I mean, if there's a, a I, I guess, you know, Arlene can address when she does a change, uh, you know, someone comes into the planning board you know, you have to notify so many neighbors and stuff like that, that that would be a different uh, situation. Um, but to address some of your other things, your other concerns and, and comments is that we do have a signage law. Uh, we do have a lighting law and we also have a, um, uh, a noise ordinance. So those all still are in effect at this point in time. So if any one of those things are in violation of the law, those can be enforced you know, at any, at any point in time, whether it be an event venue or, uh, or anything else. I mean, we had a, a situation where someone was having a yard sale every weekend. And it, uh, yeah, I make the comment that it's like going south to the border where every, every so, so many poles, it, there's another sign. And, and that's just ridiculous. That's not what we want in our town. Um, so, uh, you know, so again, you know, we do have a, a sign law that, that does address those things. And you can certainly um, everybody has to comply to those those uh, particular laws. Uh, without this law, um, it's already in existence. I don't I don't know if that's been followed up on then along the highway. Um, there's little rascal signs well, all again, along the highway. Like anything else, if if nobody complains about 
something specific, um, you know, you're relying on the zoning enforcement officer to actually run by and, and take notice. Um, they may take notice on their own, um, but it's usually from complaint that those things are usually addressed. What, how, how do you think um, this particular parcel, because um, obviously we're addressing old Adrian's farm, um, as far as parking, I see, you know, the, the parking shall be adequately screened. Well, I don't think that, I think that's ridiculous. They don't have the ability to do that. Um, but they, they, they do park along the access way, which is already a one lane road. Um, Arlene made a re reference to field road. Well, you might as well call Creek road a one lane road too. There was a time at, at one time, Adrian says we're going to lend lean off property. So that could be a dead ended street. What a wonderful idea for us homeowners that would have been because it's, it's the back roads of Georgia on that road. So th th there's no way they can, they can abide by the disguising of vehicles in a parking area. They, they can't abide by the 100 foot setback. They just can't do it. It's not practical, but we do somehow have to figure out a better way to regulate the parking and the field and absolutely restrict it off the road. Absolutely restrict it. First thing I want to just say is that this law is not addressing any one particular property. So I'm not here tonight to talk about one particular farm over another. When we make a law, we make a law that applies to everybody equally. And so through the planning process, then we get into specifics about one particular farm and having them comply to those aspects of the law. And if they don't comply currently, then you have to go for a variance. Okay, okay. I mean, what, one of my things, I'm just gonna chime in here, um, because I, I've read uh, your your email, Jerry, as well, and, and points are very well taken. Um, you know, when we started doing some of these laws and before I was even on the board, um, one of my concerns was always protecting our residents as well uh, with the with the law. You know uh, that that comes out here, such as yourself. You know, with the with the noise and you know because we have a certain way of life. I I always use these terms. You buy next to an airport, you expect to hear the planes. Hence my house down in Florida. So I hear the planes, I accept that. Or you buy next to a farm, but it's running as a farm, but it's changing the it's changing the need because it's going on every day with that. Um, I think some of that is going to be where to answer one of your questions was uh, like the, the notice given when they go for their planning review process, once the law is passed, um, that's when you'll definitely get some sort of notification on that to be able to be part of that discussion. I'm um, sorry, discussion. Um, but I do agree it, it should also protect and, and through those processes, it should protect you as uh, the neighbor as well. So I just- I was at the planning board, I was at the town of Poughkeepsie planning board one night mm -hmm. and a lady stood up or a gentleman stood up actually and complained about the noise from Mulligan's Irish pub. Didn't you know that that noise existed when you bought a house next to and on Route 376 next to an established business. That's the opposite here. We had a way of life. Now for our, prop, you know, I know this is for townwide, but for the, the case that we're, I'm speaking on, we were there, now you come in. So progress, but what at, a, at what a cost? You know, how Mangold used to say, Indians used to walk through here. So progress, but at what cost? That's correct. Justin, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Sure. Okay. And I'm new to this Zoom as well. So um, my, my main concern, I guess, is, is the noise. Um, you know, I'm next to Adrian's farm. Again, me and Jerry both take very a lot of pride in our property. But I've addressed the noise with the code enforcement officer and stuff like that, and nothing has been accomplished. I've been, pretty much been told we're not going to address that. We're not going to tie it up in the courts. Um, I realize this isn't all we're not here for one particular farm, but uh, I read through the laws and I'm just curious on how everything is going to be enforced because the law is only as good as the enforcement of it. Otherwise, it's just a waste of paper. And that's and kind of- and That was um, really was, part, part of the, the, the planning process of, of creating the law is that, you know, we can, we can institute all these different rules and regulations, but if nobody's going to do anything about it, then we're wasting our time. Abs um, and abs absolutely. That's my concern is that up until this point, the code enforcement officer has failed to act on anything or even take any type of enforcement action whenever there's been viable complaints 
uh, with the existing laws that are on, in effect uh, for the town of Clinton. So, and I've, I've read your emails too, so I, I yes. know what your, your email was, um, but as, as far as, uh, you know, specific, whether it be a sign, whether it be a noise, um, uh, once a, a noise complaint is, is made, you have to catch it so that you can have a meter and you can test at the edge of the property as to what the noise level is. Um, so that would have been the process, but I guess all events have stopped in that particular case. But in, in, in all cases, it's, it's a matter of uh, if, if someone's having a party every single night, doesn't matter if it's your neighbor or whoever, you know, there is a noise ordinance. So it's, it's really a matter of catching someone in the act. Um, so whether it be a complaint to the police and then followed up by the zoning enforcement officer or, you know, uh, if it's constantly happening that the zoning enforcement officer sets up a time when they're gonna go and, and enforce those, that's, that's what their job is. Here's my thing, the complaint to the police does is absolutely nothing. Police, and the, most of the police around here do not in, uh, enforce any type of local ordinances. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why even go that process. Well, it, it was just a that. matter of, and that was one of the comments with the with the email is that it sets up a a complaint and and at least it can be followed up with. Um, it, 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 it's a waste of resources. It, it sets up all it does is set up a computer entry that they came and they you know the the police do not have decimeters. We're not trained on decimeters. Mm -hmm. um, you, no, you know. Understand. That's why whenever I originally asked it, you know, about the noise and when uh, had he come out and checked on it, you know, the, the initial emails early on were, oh, yeah, I stopped on my way out to work and my way home from work. Well, seven o'clock in the morning, there's no parties going on or events and 530 in the evening, there's no events going on. You know, logically, it would say I got to go during the time of an event, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's not hard. I, I can tell you pretty much when the music's going to start up every weekend. I understand. Hey, Dean, how many, so obviously Justin and I are talking on, on, on the one parcel. How many parcels in our town do you think are going to be subject to this? You, you have Malaya's vineyards, but they're way off the road. Are, how many other pl places would this impact? When you say they're way off the road, they, they still border four houses over on Rimf Road. And the whole thing with sound is... You didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeff will tell you because you can have a party and not hear the noise that loud at the party site, but because of the echoes, it can actually jump over a valley and, and end up somewhere else. And, and, and people have complained that someone had rented the pavilion, uh, Fran Mark Park, and heard noise all the way up Browning Road. So uh, it, echoes are going to go everywhere. So Dave Stewart's also on this link. Dave lives down in the old Seidler house, um, down by the old nursery. Um, Dave teased me one day. He said, hey, he texted me. It was a weekend. Could you turn the music down? I said, I'm not at home. So I can hear the diving board at the swim and tennis club. I mean, that's all part of life, you know, but obviously the noise is traveling. Obviously the parking is a problem. Obviously the traffic is a problem. I'm just curious as to how many other places in town this is being written for or taken in consideration for? Well, I mean, it's, uh, well, we have two wineries. So we have Clinton Winery, we have Malia, we have um, Old Adrian's, we have the Duchess and the- Road, uh, the Field Road. And then we Road, have Road, Road. the Field Road. Mm -hmm. Those are the only ones that I know of. Well, there's actually one on uh, that that's gotten several complaints on um, uh, Schultz Hill. Um, yes. it, it, right. It, if I may, in, in answer to, to your question, Jerry, um, it, it, who is this law being written for? Um, Dean named a bunch of um, properties that are either you know operating correctly by permit or, or operating without, but this law is actually being written for every property in Clinton. So any property in Clinton that meets the, um, the requirements in order to apply to be an agricultural event venue could apply to be an agricultural event venue and then they would be subject to following all of these um, uh, um, codes and laws that are in here as part of that permit use. Um, there are still people who are going to do it without the permit. Um, 
since we're talking about old Adrian's, for example, old Adrian's doesn't hold a, a permit to hold to, to be able to do those events at all. Um, so regardless of what the law says, and I think Dean alluded to this before, said this before, it really becomes an enforcement issue. And part of that is creating that paper trail. And, you know, I get it that for law enforcement, for example, it's a waste of time. It's absolutely a waste of time. And, you know, I look at that as I, I, I try to be a good neighbor and, you know, operating the farm, we try to be a good neighbor. Um, and we did a lot of experimentation with sound travel and um, the Duchess is a 236 acre parcel. Um, our closest neighbor is, I think it's 2,700 feet um, from, from where we, we, we hold most of our activities. And yet the sound travels through the trees. We, I talked to a, 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 an acoustic engineer who explained that trees can actually amp amplify the sound and increase the distance that it travels because they vibrate with the noise. And so our response to that um, was to change our events. We no longer do events at night. The sound ordinance, and I, I think this is a ridiculous hour, but the sound ordinance is effective at eight o'clock PM. So any noise that, that is heard at the edge of the property of a certain decibel after eight o'clock PM is a violation. If somebody comes to us and wants to do an event, we're very clear about that. We're like, you know, if, you, if your event is small enough, we'll move you inside a building, but otherwise you're not gonna be outside with sound. Um, so in that sense, we sort of do self-enforcement. It'd be nice if everybody did that, but that's not a thing. I think one of the things we still have to solve um, is how do we do this level of enforcement? And at an earlier um, uh, meeting, it was talked about um, you know, having the, a full-time zoning administrator and then a part-time uh, code enforcement officer. Uh, and of course the pandemic came. Um, so where was that left? Is that still the plan to, to have that part-time position and fill that, which would be new and as I understood, was specifically designed to have somebody that could address code enforcement. Um, well, finding someone has always been the issue, but yeah. um, you bring up the pandemic and, and that also added a, a different problem this year is that, you know, most restaurants and bars and everything else were forced to, you know, seat people outside. Um, so this year forced everybody to have outside events rather than having inside events, if they had any events at all. And with the limitation, limitation. So this this year should not really be the the measure of of what's to come because eventually when we can have things inside, I mean that should all be you know hopefully uh, calm down as well. I don't know if I I don't know if I agree with that statement, Dean, because um, during a pandemic we were we were restricted as to how many people we could have inside, how many people we could have at a venue. Um, I think come pandemic, once the pause is lifted, I think we're in for a, a lot of trouble on this, on this at this parcel. My sister-in-law owns a very successful winery and apple picking venue in Marlboro. If I was on her street, I'd be doing the same thing I'm now. But it's only eight weekends. It's before. It, it's it's during the day. It's eight weekends of the year, and it's done. We basically are opening a gin mill next door. 24 seven. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a stretch, but it's every night there's music, there's alcohol, there's parking. This is every night. I think it's going to be, it, it, ha, it could be hazardous next year for us. Well, I, I think we're really, really, we've only seen a bit of it. Yeah. You were forced it's to go outside, it. but if it's I own it. that venue, if I own that venue, I'm never bringing my participants inside. I want them to enjoy, enjoy the Vista around them. Sorry, Justin. That's no, I was going to say the same thing. That's what that, that's the outside is the draw to an event like that. It's not to be inside. Um, same as Jerry, once I saw that uh, buildings should be soundproofed for the ag uh, events law, I, I loved it. I said, great, maybe the noise will so finally stop. There's an issue whenever I'm sitting in my house, windows closed, air conditioned on, and I'm still hearing the exact, the words to the song. Uh, that you know that are playing the, the amplifiers are so loud that that's an issue I'm not even outside I'm in the house with the air conditioning on and windows closed in the summer um, being outside I've shot the line to see how far off I am from where the music's playing it's approximately 1,020 feet I'm hearing clearly in my yard even what the you know the music it's not just a, a slight a dull uh, hum of the music that somebody's playing next door it's it's very loud it's as if I'm next to I've said it before the fairgrounds 
I, I feel like I, I'm in Rhinebeck next to the fairgrounds during fair week at my house on the weekends whenever we're here to enjoy. Um, the other issue I just do want to bring up is the roadway. That road's one lane at best down by the farm uh, and in other areas. Uh, the traffic is atrocious. Uh, you know, you can't even walk with the one Saturday. I walked with my daughter down just for a walk down the road. I counted no less than 75 cars passing us on a one lane road. Um, you know, there. You, you God help the people are actually trying to park everyone within the parking area, but they're placing cones in the middle of the roadway, stopping free traffic, which that's that's a violation of New York State traffic law. Um, there's just a lot of there's a lot of violations that have occurred that haven't been addressed, and I'm afraid that this new law is nobody's going to enforce it at, as well. That's that's a big concern of mine. Well, again, you know, what we're trying to do is make a law that applies to the whole town. And, and so without a law, there's nothing to enforce. And, and so we have to start somewhere. Um, and you're talking about specific things on a specific, specific farm. Um, I, I, I am speaking of this, as, but, in you know, certainly as part of the planning process, you know, to get a, a having to go to the planning board to to get their uh, their permit um, is where all these particular cases should be mentioned. And I understand I am speaking in specifics just because that's all I know. That, that, that's the, what I know for Ag Events Law. This is the only, uh, you know, uh, circumstance that I have to address off of. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on any one particular venue, um, but that's all I have it to base it off of. Um, you know. No, I understand. Dean, can I make a suggestion? Dean? Yep, go ahead. Um, is it okay? I think we should leave the public hearing open because you, you're still waiting for the comments from Dutchess County Planning. So that that version that you have, it's gonna get revised. So I think, you know, with, in fairness to everybody, they need to, to read that, to see that and make a comment. So closing the public hearing, I think. Well, there's uh, not gonna be significant changes and Dutchess Pl County Planning had already really approved what we did verbally. They just never sent it to us, you know, in writing. So I don't ex expect them to make any comment um, beyond, you know, yes, you, you met all the requirements that we had really uh, objected to originally. So I, I, I don't see a need if we've already exhausted the you know. law. And that's and I'd like, I'd like to say that we, um, the reason that we reintroduced the law rather than introduce it again, because this was the version that Dutchess County Planning reviewed when we sent it to them formally. We made all of the changes that they suggested and the town attorney sent the revised changes to them for a quick look, which they seemed to be satisfied with. So we actually addressed all of their issues. So in the reintroduction, the conversation last week was the pandemic has been, you know, caused us to be shut down for eight months they really wanted another formal review simply because of the time that has lapsed just to give it a formal okay. So the version we sent them is the version that they're familiar with and I really don't expect them to come back with too many significant changes. Right. So could I just ask in, in finishing up then I'll stop buttoning in. Um, in fairness to the persons that were that obviously Justin and I are addressing. What guidelines did they have? And, and I commend you guys for your work. You, you, you can't be complimented enough. You've put so much time into this. So kudos to all of you and, and, and our wonderful town. Um, what guidelines did any of these parcels, venues have to go by pre this legislation that you guys are trying to adopt? Was there any, was any of this on there? beforehand when they applied for permits? Did they apply for permits? Nobody has a permit because it's not a law. So okay, the only, that's, that's the question. The only permit that they could apply for is, would be a conference center. And at this point, they should be complying with noise ordinances and, and you know, well, not blocking the road. That's different. They should be, and they're not. And we know that that's an enforcement issue. I mean, I commend Jeff, yeah. where he says that the, the Duchess has been uh, self-regulating themselves. They've been complying with all of these things uh, voluntarily and we wish others would do that. But this law at least force, will force venues like the one we're talking about to come in, apply for a permit. They will be told by the planning board what, what 
um, requirements they need to meet. And then if they don't, we have more of a, we have more teeth really to go after them for it because uh, they've agreed to these things and gotten the permit and we can then revoke a permit if they don't follow those guidelines. In, in fairness to the farm, I can tell you the last event they had, um, Stacy Higgins, one of the owners, she actually texted me, hey neighbor, we're gonna have an event this weekend. If it gets too loud, please let me know. So if they didn't have guidelines to follow, yeah, some of it, Michael, obvi is obvious, you know, the parking and some of that, that's just obvious. I agree with you. Um, if they didn't have guidelines to follow, then hopefully this is the, you know, the, 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 the metric by which we're gonna judge all these establishments henceforth. And I, and I stopped down there and, and, um, and one of the bands that was playing. Um, um, well, if it was Vito, you can't talk about Vito. No, it wasn't Vito. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, of, one of the events, um, um, they went up and told the band that you have to lower the noise. And the, the person, uh, the control board guy, whatever, he actually said he went to the property line and measured the sound. So, um, that's one particular case. So I, I do know that they, they, they asked for people to wear masks. They, they have asked for people to turn oh, the nose down. So I, you know, just the one time, you know, that, that I saw that particular incident happen, you know, it, it, listen, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, if she's having too many events, again, I don't want to talk about any particular person, but if someone's having too many events, and it becomes an issue, that's going to be an issue for, for keeping a permit if you get one. Hey, Dean, um, real quick, uh, having to deal with the noise ordinance, is that is that listed clearly on the website? Is that where we'd find that? Yeah, you're going to go to, well, from our website, it's going to link you to Code 360, and Code 360 has all of our, our zoning laws. Okay. It's, on, um, it's okay. on, Dave, it's on the front page of the web and it's just called the town code. Okay. Dave, and, you know, section at 250-28. 250-28. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. I just, uh, like I said, I, I live up the road, like uh, Jerry had mentioned, and I did kind of ingest uh, mention to him one time. I was out by my pool. Again, speaking one uh, about that one location, I was out by my pool, I am, and I just pulled it up on Dutch County Far Slacks, I'm over 3,200 feet away from the venue, and I can hear their music over my music by the pool, and I'm blessed to be an electrician, so I can just get bigger speakers, but that's not going to make my neighbors happy, so, um, so that's okay, and, and that was it, you know, not that I'm making a big deal about it, I just want to know what the rules are, so that, you know, I follow, and everybody else follows them, so thanks for that, okay. and good job, everybody. Thanks. So uh, again, I don't want to talk about any specific person or parcel, but the law itself. So if there's no further comments to the law, then I would just close the public hearing. Um, and as far as particular person or parcel, once they get their permit, they're going to have to apply and go to the planning board. And that's when you can sp specifically address those items. I do have one question on the law, just in regards to the traffic, uh, to traffic on any of the roads. Uh, it said, who deems it, uh, I guess, who would make the decision that it was unsafe? Cause it did say that it would be uh, at the venue's requirement to, uh, I guess, uh, have law enforcement or whatever come and, and facilitate the traffic. Uh, who, who makes that decision if it becomes the issue? Uh, you know, it's been a while since I read that specific. That yeah, let me, I'm gonna look through here and try to find it. I thought I highlighted it. I thought it was based on a size. No, I don't think it was based on a size. I know there were size requirements that the town could state how many people were able to uh, attend specific venues. It's on page four and it says uh, it's section four. Um, if the planning board determines yeah. that the regulation of traffic on roads shall be necessary, such regulation shall only be done by law enforcement personnel. Um, the cost of such traffic regulation shall be fully paid by the agricultural event venue. So that would apply uh, as, um, uh, as an applicant goes through the process with the planning board to get the special use permit in the first place, the planning board will review that and say, look, every event that you have, you're going to need traffic control or any event you have over 50 people, you're going to need traffic control. They would make that determination. 
Well, I mean, at the time of application, then during the during the approval process. Okay. Okay. And Jeff, when that originally was talked about, it was to stop the event, uh, the event venue from just sending a kid out to the street. Exactly. Right. And that's really what the intent was. Putting that language in there was to specifically say you can't put someone out to regulate the street. Number one, you're not allowed to. It's against the law. But you know, it's just spelling it out so that people knew that. You just can't send, you know, some flagger out in the middle of Route 9G and, and you know, think it's okay. Sure. No, I just think it's just an important point being that most of these venues are on the back or, you know, smaller back roads in the, in the town. It's probably going to be, you know, something that's going to come to fruition right. at some point with the events. And, and with, with all of the things in here, again, it, it does go to enforcement. But as Dean mentioned, until this law is actually on the books, there, there's nothing to point to to say that, oh, you should have applied for a permit. You don't even have a permit to operate, let alone yeah. meet any of these requirements that are part of that permit. Um, so once this is in place, then it's an easier process for the, the, the code enforcement official to actually step in there. Um, so in terms last of last month with the, you know, Airbnbs and, you know, we didn't have anything on the books. So when people were complaining about the handful of, 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 places that were having a problem, you know, we, we supposedly have between 80 and 100 um, Airbnbs, but there was four or five that we were getting the most complaints of. Well, we didn't have a code to, um, to enforce. Right. Um, and in, in terms of enforcement, in particular for something like this with, that is relevant to, to farms and agriculture, um, New York State Ag and Markets Law does allow for and protect farms to hold events, including weddings. It has very specific limitations on those things. And that's, that's section 305A. Um, and those limitations are specific to um, the, um, the, the um, percentage of revenue generated by total events, as opposed to the total revenue generated by the farm. Now, a lot of farmers or farm operation uh, operators uh, will use limited knowledge of ag and markets law to claim protections that they don't actually have. But I mention it because it doesn't all have to fall on the town. Um, it also, uh, when you have a farm that is taking advantage of um, ag and markets law, it can also be sent to New York State ag and markets. And again, Jeff, it, by that yeah. language, it, it does specify that only 30% of your revenue can be become. Okay, that can right. come from these events. So that's supposed to limit the, the amount of business that you're doing other than farming. Right. So th th obviously, so there was up to this point, there wasn't anything to necessitate applying for a permit because there wasn't anything on the books that, that constituted the need for a permit. Is that correct? And you guys are doing that now. That, a need we, I feel bad that we're like picking on one entity um, and I didn't know what this, so obviously we're trying to put something on the books that everybody can abide by. Yeah, well, there was another event that was having more complaints than this one early on. So that, that one ha happened to really kind of get more attention than, uh, than the Adrian's farm. But um, nonetheless, it's, it, it's a thing to come. I mean, you can see all over the county. And, and some places like Hyde Park is very favorable of, of having event venues. I mean, if you read the Hyde Park law, it's much more generous. And, and since you were all living on the border of Hyde Park, uh, you know, someone could actually have an event venue right across the street of 9G, be in the town of Hyde Park and do a lot worse. That's, I think right. our law is right. a lot more restrictive. Okay. I commend you guys all. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I will sign up for the newsletter. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all yeah, for participating. Yeah. This has been wonderful. Jerry, Thank you go, all. go to the website and hit the subscribe button. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Carol. This You're has welcome. been great. This has been great. Hey, Dean, you can make the motion. So I make a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a I'll second, second it. Giuliano second. Okay, roll call vote. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Overly aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. M Whitney? Aye. Motion carried. 
Now we're going to close the meeting. I make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Juliano, yes. second. Roll call vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Juliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Whitten? Aye. Motion carried. Meeting is over, and we will now jump into the regular town board meeting. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for letting us have a voice. Great job. Okay. I'd like to call the regular town board meeting on December 8th, 2020 to order. It's uh, being held via teleconferencing with Zoom and with YouTube live stream to the public. Uh, there's no audience participation allowed in this meeting. Members of the public can view the board meeting in its live stream or on town board videos from the Town of Clinton website. Now we have to do another uh, attendance to establish a quorum because this is a separate meeting. Supervisor Oberly here, Councilwoman Cunningham. Yeah. Councilman Giuliano. Here. Councilman Dean Michael. Here. Councilman Witten. Here. Town Clerk Mackin. Here. We do have a quorum so we can conduct business. The first items are a whole bunch of minutes that we got to approve. And we're going to have a lot of them. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the October 29, 2020 special meeting. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Whitman? Aye. Motion carried. Next one. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 5, 2020 public hearing on the 2021 budget. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call. Overly aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Witten? Aye. Motion carried. Next one. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 10th, 2020 public hearing on community development block grant. Is there a second? Giuliano, second. <laughs> Okay, roll call vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Dean? Aye. Okay. Wilton? Aye. Motion carried. On to the next one. Told you there were lots. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 10th, 2020 public hearing on short term rental local law. Is there a second? Michael, second. Roll call. Overly aye. Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. I make a motion to approve minutes of the November 10th, 2020 town board meeting. Is there a second? Dean Michael. Giuliano, second. Roll call. Overly aye. Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, next one. This is the last one. I make a motion to approve the minutes of the November 17, 2020 special town board meeting to adopt the budget. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Roll call. Overly. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. Now we go into supervisor's comments. I have a few comments here. The town offices, highway department, justice court office and court will be closed for the Christmas holiday on Friday, December 25th and New Year's Day holiday on Friday, 
January 1st, 2021. The Clinton Community Library will be closed on the same days. The recycling center will be open as usual from 7.30 a.m. to noon on Saturdays, December 26th and January 2nd. Community Power has developed a simpler process to become a member and to receive up to a 10% reduction in your electric bill. The town will get a $50 donation for every person joining Community Power. More details are on the town webpage, www.townofclinton.com. The tax collector moved her office in December from the town hall to the schoolhouse. A secure drop box will be installed on the left side of the schoolhouse entrance door to allow residents to drop off only their tax payments. All drop offs for other offices are to use the drop off box boxes on the porch of the town hall. For in-person reservation, in-person reserved appointments, the office hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to noon. Appointments can be made by calling 845-266-5721 extension 141 or email to taxcollector at townofclinton.com. Residents are encouraged to pay by mail, use the aforementioned secure drop box, or pay online. To pay online, go to the town's webpage, www.townofclinton.com, click on departments, then go to tax collectors, collector, and you'll see the payment portal. The power line information update. We did have a presentation uh, about a week ago. The town continues to work on an agreement with Transco on the repair of damaged town roads when their equipment will need to cross the roads. Currently, they are starting construction at the northern end of the transmission line. Transco gave their presentation on December 3rd over Zoom to the community. The video, PowerPoint, and minutes of the presentation will be placed on the town's webpage under town board for those who missed the live presentation. For much, for much more information on the project is available on their webpage, www.ny-yes.com. Some of the Clinton highlights are the current towers have an average height of 82 feet, while the new monopoles, because that's what they're doing, they're taking the two towers down and putting one monopole in, have an average height of 90 feet. There are six new monopoles that are 100 feet tall. Transco will be available, will have available an agricultural co coordinator to help coordinate farmers with their crops and Transco's construction activities in the transmission right of way. Actual construction in Clinton will begin in 2022. Additional Transco presentations will be scheduled in 2021 as more information becomes available. The Clinton Community Library has a Transco laptop that is loaded with much of the technical details that were presented to the Public Service Commission as part of the approval process for the project. The laptop will be updated as new and more information becomes available. Okay, the next item is uh, Councilman Giuliano. All righty. Um, I would like to uh, make a motion uh, to approve the following resolution, be it resolved that Highway Superintendent Todd Martin join the town board meeting to be able to participate in the discussion of the uh, highway bids. Is there a second? He might have second. second. Okay, roll call. Oberly, aye. Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Is he going to talk now, or is he coming in later? Um, I, well, we have uh, the highway bids on the third. Okay, no, I just didn't know when he wrote it. When yeah. it on. Come on now. Huh? Hello. 
Good evening, okay. everybody. So, okay. Uh, are you going to say something or are you going to wait for the bids and stuff? Um, the one thing I want to bring up tonight is the, uh, the COVID with restrictions. The highway department is uh, locked down right now. Um, the doors are locked. The signs are up on the front gate and on the back of the building. Um, appointment is needed. Masks are uh, mandatory. Uh, the doors to the entrance to the front and the back doors will remain locked 24 seven. Everybody and anybody that works for the highway department um, has to have a key to enter or exit the building. Um, once the highway employees or anybody else that has an appointment comes into the building, they are mandatory to have a mask. Um, Councilwoman uh, Nancy Cunningham has furnished us with the hand sanitizers. They are required. Uh, anybody that enters or exits the building for any reason um, has to use the hand sanitizer and has to have a mask on as long as you are in the highway department building and the vehicles or anywhere as such. Um, during this time, I've been speaking with the uh, New York State Highway Association of uh, Highway Superintendents along with Dutchess County. Um, we're trying to come up with a game plan and a backup plan in case either one or all of our employees come down with the virus um, to have a backup plan. Um, tonight, uh, Councilman uh, Giuliano hopefully makes the resolution and a motion. I have one employee right now um, to hire as a temporary employee um, for the winter. It's on call. There's no benefits, no health insurance or any of that to follow along with. Um, and what it is, is uh, it's Tom O'Brien. He previously worked for the highway department. So he's familiar with our operations. He's familiar with our roads and our trucks and stuff like that. Um, he does have a CDL class B, which is required for any of the highway department trucks um, that require that. So he does have the class B license. Um, when he's not driving one of those trucks, um, he will be driving one of the, either one of the smaller dump trucks or one of the pickup trucks for us. And it's on call. Um, there's no set hours with him. I can call him one o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock at night or whatever. Um, he's on call. That is the only one that I have right now as a backup plan as a, as a temporary employee. I've been reaching out to several contractors in the town of Clinton, trying to keep everything local to try to find contractors that in case one or all of my employees at the highway department comes infected, I have to have a backup plan. I have a uh, job and responsibility to maintain the roads in a safely fashion for any type of storm, whether it's ice, snow, trees down or something like that. So if one or all of my employees at the highway department come infected, I still have to reach out to somebody, anybody, contractors in the town or outside to maintain these roads, plow them, sand them or whatever. Um, I've been working with Supervisor Oberly, our insurance company with uh, Nicole to start running some of these contractors um, that we had in mind that are local here to uh, help us in case we do have to shut the shop down for 14 days or whatever it may, may be with Dutch County Department of Health with Kathy Tegmeyer down there um, to come up with a game plan to uh, have somebody, anybody to help us out. Um, there is three local contractors right now in town um, that are willing to help us out um, in case there is uh, an infection or COVID cases in the, the highway department to come and help us out. I'm trying to work out the logistics of it as far as money wise, insurance, workers comp and all that with Supervisor Oberly and our insurance company to make sure they're legal and legit so we're not hiring somebody fly by night um, to cover us in case something does happen. Um, that's basically it with the COVID right now. Um, we are taking every and any precaution uh, necessary to not get infected. I'm trying to limit the guy's exposure to the outside uh, world, we call it, as far as like going to stores or interacting with the public and stuff with, like that. Um, if more than, uh, no more than two guys in a truck, they both have to have mask on. We disinfect the trucks before uh, they start work in the morning. At night when they leave, um, the vehicles are disinfected. Uh, we are on a three-week schedule of uh, Councilwoman Nancy Cunningham provided us with the uh, fogging machines. So we are fogging the highway department, um, the offices, the cruise break room, the bathroom, um, upstairs, the parts room, the sign room. We are doing the old shop. 
Uh, Dutchess County sheriffs have reached out to us because they do have a substation there. So they're asking us when we fog the old shop and the bathroom over there, which the sheriffs use, if we can do the sheriff's office and stuff like that. So this way, if a sheriff comes in, uses our bathroom, one of our guys goes over and uses that bathroom, we're trying to limit every and any exposure possible. I'm, I'm, I'm adamant about this. I, I could not afford to have one or all the whole crew go down during the winter season. It'd be, uh, I don't know how to put it, but it would be very bad if we get a snowstorm and we have to go down. Uh, I'll be reaching out to you councilmen and women and other people to help us with our trucks and plowing and sanding. There's nothing else, you know, that I, I've been trying everything and anything possible to limit our exposure at the highway department, put it that way. Okay. Now we'll go to the next agenda item, Dean, on events law. Yeah, like I said, uh, we, we, we're going to postpone it until uh, January's meeting, until we got feedback from the... Um... December, December 30th. No, 29th. Oh, December 29th meeting. Yeah, 29th. Okay. The other dates are correct further back, but this one you missed. So... December 29th, we can uh, pick it up. Okay, so that's it. Okay, next one is the short term rental local law fees. Yeah, this is, I mean, uh, obviously we've been talking about fees for a little while. Uh, I just want to start off. I did make another small change with Carol today. We added the word end to a statement uh, <laughs> by cemeteries just to make sure the statement above the cemetery fees was correct, but it, it makes no big change. Um, we're throwing it all out. Yep, we're throwing everything away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then I didn't turn to the right page, so I'm looking forward here. But we had discussed basically doing fees for short-term rentals that followed um, the special permit fees. Uh, so it would be, uh, I believe, $250 for a non-hosted special permit uh, $200 for a renewal, $150 for a hosted certificate, and $100 for a renewal. Um, we did receive a couple of emails. Um, I don't know that I necessarily need to read them. I know all the town board members read them. Those emails want us to raise the fees higher, say significantly higher. Um, so my feelings on this, I, I wrote down a lot of thoughts, but my first is that there's been an assumption that we're gonna have a rash of violations um, and complaints simply because we passed the law. Um, as Dean pointed out, we have between 80 and 100 short-term rentals in town. Um, you actually overestimated how many have had complaints on them. I, I checked with our zoning enforcement officer um, and there were two that we know of. One was on Longview and it was resolved almost immediately. Um, and this is in the past two years. And the other complaint um, is wrapped up in a series of complaints that are happening on Deer Ridge Drive. So that one has not been resolved yet. Um, but it, there has not been a, a large number of complaints. So I just don't see that with this law passing that we're going to get suddenly a rash of complaints on them. We will have violations of people not applying for a permit that we'll have to deal with. Um, I feel like in the past, Ray has rightfully reminded us that our fees need to be based on the actual cost to the town. Um, so I had conversations with both the zoning enforcement officer and the building inspector, and they agree that, I think I actually raised the non-hosted fee from uh, 125 to 150 based on one of those conversations. Um, and they think that those fees are, are in line with, uh, with the work that they're going to perform. Um, I think that if we have much higher fees, especially when we're asking for a special permit, uh, if we have much higher fees for the short-term rentals, but we're not doing that for other special permits, then we're, we're writing a law that is treating one group of people unequally, um, which makes me uncomfortable. Um, and the simple fact that to me, you know, the short-term rental law makes a residential building and let, allows someone to use it as a residential building. Um, and I think that when we start throwing around the term commercial activity, I understand that somebody's making money off of their property, but I think it's meant to make short-term rentals sound like something worse than what they are. Um, we have, we allow barbershops 
and machine shops in the town of Clinton. Um, without any special permits, they're just an allowed use. And I would argue that things like that are changing the use of a residential building more than a short-term rental would. Um, so I think if we want to make these fees really high, it seems punitive to me. And if we're going to have punitive measures, that should be in the punishment sort section of our law. It should be in the fine section and violations, um, not when we ask for uh, fees for permits. So that's my argument to keep it where they are. And I, I think for the general public, you might define what non-hosted and hosted are just in case people don't understand that and haven't been involved with the STR. Yeah, the short-term rental law uh, splits uh, short-term rentals into two categories. One is hosted where uh, the owner of the residence uh, is either living in the main home or an accessory dwelling on the property while it's being rented out. And non-hosted is when the owner is, is not present while it's being rented out. And that one requires a special permit um, and a higher fee. You know, uh, can we have some discussion on this or we got to? Yeah, absolutely. All right. I mean, I haven't so, even made the motion yet. So. No, well, I, well, I didn't know if we, we were going to. So, you know, I, I, I agree to a certain degree on that. I mean, like I said, the non-hosted, um, I, I think uh, is, is fine because the, I'm sorry, the uh, hosted is fine because obviously the owner's on the property or someone's on the property that's representing the property. Um, I think it is changing, you know, again, it's kind of going back with the, uh, in mind with the event law uh, that, you know, we're going to get people that are potentially buying several houses and running them. And even, yes, I understand the term residential. It's funny because I always say uh, with my clients, uh, you know, when they say, well, geez, it's a rental house and you're doing work, it's commercial work, it's a commercial endeavor. My insurance changes with that uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little different. So it is a commercial endeavor where there are people changing multiple times in a week on there. And I do agree from my conversations as well that there's been limited problems uh, across the board so far with that. Uh, but I go back to uh, when I was uh, first getting on the board and, and on working on some of these laws that there should be a benefit to the town and the town residents uh, regarding the uh, fees you know, I do understand that the, the county gets some take in, in the uh, fees, uh, the taxes for these uh, Airbnbs and, and uh, so forth. Yeah, they get an um, occupancy but, tax just like a hotel does. Yes. So they, so they you know, the, 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 the uh, person who's renting the place is getting the, uh, you know, paying the, the fee towards that. But I do think and it could change. If we wanted to do it, we could pass a law and... and and do it too. We could charge an occupancy tax, just like the village of Rhinebeck does. Well, then that's, uh, that might be another way to do it then. So it's a, you know, as far as it's a benefit to the town. Yeah, I think I, that's what I'm looking at because it, it's, it, we're, we're a bedroom community by nature in here. And it's, we have limited uh, commercial establishment to, to benefit that, you know, have a tax offset for our residents. And most of us accept, you know, we pay more taxes because we have less commercial re uh, areas. Um, but I think uh, I, I might agree with the idea that Dean just said uh, doing something like that. So it's not specific to the homeowner that's doing this. What do yeah, you I have a, a couple of things is if we make the fees exorbitantly high, then we're punishing all of the people that comply with it, which is going to be the vast majority of mm -hmm. them. Um, I'm not saying of, make it high. I'm just okay. saying make it real to the to the point. I'm not saying going to but, a thousand dollars a house. I'm but when we start that. talking about the fees should be beneficial to the town, that's when I go back to what Ray has talked about in the past with fees is that we're supposed to be charging fees that cover our costs. That's what the fee schedule's for, mm -hmm. not so that we can make money and improve the park, say, or do something. No, for the I understand that. I think what we're having though, we do have a few. Uh, cases going on with neighbors fighting neighbors that's costing the town money and as if we get a few more of these going on uh, this is stuff that can potentially uh, impact the funds within the town to be uh, driven to court cases uh, not to go into specifics now I'm not saying there's anything specific going on with the short-term rentals at this point um, but that should also be a, a certain percentage that should be a factor into 
you know, as an insurance for the town uh, as part of the fees. Um, if it's a way of doing it through a tax, you know, through a small tax that the town gets a portion of, of these ones, maybe that's the way to offset it for make it beneficial to the residents. Now, I'll say I, as a capitalist, I think, you know, in a person that feels on property or owner rights, I, you know, I, I think it's a two way street and I'm be the first one to support property owners rights to do what they want on there. But uh, as we heard from uh, Jerry on the other side of things, and some people go a little bit further, we want to make sure that, you know, some of the residents that are not expecting that, you know, that uh, they see some sort of benefit. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that. Ray, uh, you're muted, Ray. Muted. Uh, Michael, <clears throat> I also agree with your logic. I don't think we should be punishing people uh, for doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think we need to play this out uh, with the fees that you've recommended. And if there is a need to change it, we always have an opportunity to do so. Uh, but I think the punitive thing is not the right way to go. And um, based on what Ray had pointed out earlier, these fees should be solely for covering the cost to administer this program, not to make additional uh, revenue. So I agree with your logic. And I would be happy to revisit, like this would be a zoning violation, which is, you know, the first offense is zero to $350. Second offense, 350 to 700. Third is 700 to 1,000. I'd be happy to revisit that. And if we feel that our, our, our fine should be higher to discourage people from acting poorly, yeah, then let's talk about that. But I think the fees for the permit, we shouldn't punish them before they do anything wrong. Right. And we have a lot of punitive reaction, like you said. So, yeah. I mean, it's built in. And I think we have to see what happens. Yeah. We're anticipating things that we really can't back up at this point. So, yeah. you know, um, I, I, I kind of have a little bit of mixed feeling on it, but, um, you know, I'm fine with the fee to just to start off with it. It's just that, um, you know, one way to look at it is if I think we're looking at what's the worst possible scenario and, and we don't really have a lot of cheap homes in, in the town of Clinton. Mm. So the person that's going to probably Airbnb is someone that's going to spend a little bit more. So we're not going to always get the problems that we hear that other towns may have uh, with the rowdy kids, which is, the, I guess, what the problem was on Deer Ridge. Um, uh, and, and maybe it's because I, I don't know what that house is. Cause I haven't driven by it, but, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a lower scale house. And maybe that's where the problem is. But, you know, uh, some of these Airbnbs are like the, the, the one on Sunrise, I think is getting like $10,000 a, a day or something ridiculous. Um, so I, I don't see that we're going to have a problem. And, and looking at just for the fact that if I rent, let's say, my house for six months at a time, I don't have to comply with any of this. You know, if it, so really all I'm doing is I'm renting maybe six times to six different families. And what's the difference? That the impact is still the same. You still have people coming and going into a house. So I don't really see it per well, se being a problem. The, the, and, and I would focus per se on, on the violations more so than, than the fee itself because yeah. it shouldn't be that the town is there to make money. Um, so I, I don't think the town should be a money generator and I do believe that someone should be able to use their property as long as they're not hurting, they're just, you know, uh, you know, interfering with their their neighbors, um, you know, enjoyment. Well, oh, go ahead, Ray. I'm sorry, I'm going to let you. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with the fee schedule. I have no problem with that. I want people to realize that the fee schedule is just one piece of the cost of getting your permit. You've got legal notices, you've got letters to your neighbors, you've got all kinds of stuff associated with the permitting process. And they got to pay for that. We're not paying for that. That's out of their escrow or their pocket, however you want to call it. So uh, we're covered with some of those things, okay? Now, the other thing you're saying, well, we want to increase the fine structure. Uh, unfortunately, New York State law does put limitations on the value of fines 
for certain types of actions. So you can't make it $2 million for five times and something like that. So uh, you got to be careful with saying that you just want to increase fines. You just can't. You got to follow what is allowed by law and it's by the categories that a misdemeanor, A, B, C, or whatever. I don't know. It's a whole another set of numbers you got to go through. So, yeah, I mean, the reality is that, you know, someone does something, we're not going to find them for like the first incident. We typically, work with people to, to remedy the situation. And most people just, they don't want to be fined either. They want to remedy the situation. And, and so the fine is there when people are not remedying the situation. That's what it's supposed to be. And, and you know, that needs to be stringent enough that people feel the sting that they're not going to kind of push the envelope. I mean, we had the one particular property, not to mention names, that was using it to, to grind stumps and, 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 and didn't care about the fines because they were less than what his revenue was. Let me ask, say something just as far as the fines, which is kind of off beat, but it kind of would have something to do with it. Um, some of the, with, with the cell towers, right? We, at points we had were, you know, renewal and they're just cheaper to pay the fines for running what they're running in the past is, I mean, does that, have any merit as far as that you make a fine that's low and I'm not about finding someone. I'm really not. What I'm about is most of them. I want to just say there's a difference of running a hosted and a non-hosted. And if someone's charging hypothetically $10,000 a day for bless them, I think that's, I think that's the capitalistic way. I'm I'm hundred percent for that. If they can do that and get it, but it changes the dynamic. It's it's a commercial venture where people are coming and going. There's a difference of someone renting out for six months. I rent my house out for six months. Out of that, the neighbors are going to see the same neighbor, same people coming and going. Um, again, I don't think, or or maybe maybe it's the initial uh, special permit fee, and then the renewals a little bit lower on that. But I, I don't support 100 percent of going at 250 for the initial. The renewal, fine. You know, after they go through it, you know, I'll make sure, you know, give them some sort of incentive. Thanks. Nancy said it previously that, you know, you can always change the fee structure. If after a year we find out it makes no sense or it's too big or too little, we change it. We've been doing that for funerals and everything else, you know, the cemetery work. We, we sort of didn't know what to do. And we've sort of now gotten a set of numbers that reasonably reflect what should be done. And I think the same thing happens here. Yeah, I agree. All right, so I'm going to make the motion. Go for it. <laughs> I make a motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved that the town board approves resolution number 52 of 2020, a resolution adopting a new fee schedule dated December 8th, 2020. Is there a second? Your second? Be Michael second. Okay. I think we had all the discussion, so let's just jump in the vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Juliana? No, based on um, the, uh, the non hosted. Not for. Dean Michael? Aye. Witten? Aye. Motion carried. Next one is approval of highway bids. Highway bids meaning. We're not buying highways. We are buying supplies for the highway department, just so you, the community understands what it means. Can we put a toll on that highway? <laughs> there yeah. we go. <laughs> we, I, you know, Revenue. We could each take turns in it and sit at the booth. Yeah, there you go. It would be an easy pass account. And <laughs> That's right. There we go. Yeah. All right. So I guess uh, this is to go over the highway bids, as Ray said, uh, that we got. Um, I'm going to make the motion and for discussion, Todd, if he wants to bring in on this, this is why he can't kind of came in here. So I'm going to make a motion to approve the following resolution, be it resolved that the town board approves awarding the 2021 highway bids to those vendors highlighted on attachment AA 2021 highway bid result. Is there a second? Dean Michael second. Honey, hand second. Go ahead. Now we have discussion. 
just let you guys know, um, as you guys see, um, Carol Jean helped me, the town clerk, with um, giving you guys a spreadsheet and everything. Some of the bids I came off of uh, Dutchess County's uh, highway material bid list. Um, so some of those culvert pipes, greater blades and stuff like that, it was cheaper for us um, to go off Dutchess County instead of uh, going with the vendors that did uh, that I reached out to for bids and stuff. Um, some of the other vendors were higher. That's why I was recommending to you five uh, board members to approve the list that I sent with you. Um, hopefully you guys got the Dutchess County's uh, bid stuff in there also. So I piggybacked off of Dutchess County, which is gonna save us on uh, greater blades, culvert pipes and uh, things like that, that um, we've been using pretty regularly and it'll save us some money by piggybacking off of Dutchess County. Yeah, the other thing I, I'd like to mention, it's not shown explicitly here because we've been doing it, is we used to go with state bid on salt and at one time it was like $95 a ton. The county also got upset with it. So the county went out and we got it down to like $75 a ton with the county bid. So we swapped over and have been using the county bid ever since. So that has saved us a tremendous amount of money now. I it's under know. it's under sixty dollars right now, Ray. Oh, I believe it? okay. it's fifty. It's either fifty-seven or fifty-eight dollars and change a ton uh, shipped to us. Yeah. Going off Dutchess County, what happened was is the uh, Dutchess County Highway Superintendents get, did an estimate of our average uh, salt usage for the winter season. They took all those numbers and put it out to bid, and that's how we came in with uh, Eastern Salt. That's the ones you see off the New York State Thruway going towards Albany on the right-hand side. Those uh, brand new buildings on the right-hand side, that's where our salt's coming out of now. They're the lowest bid for Dutchess County for us. Um, that's where our salt is being uh, pulled out of right now. I just wanted to mention, we've been doing this before, but we now are expanding it into yep. other products. Any more discussion? Okay, make the motion. Oh, we did do the motion. Okay. So uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham. Aye. Mike Giuliano. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. The next one is uh, a Sam Grant resolution for the library ramp uh, with a change of year of uh, the budget cycle. Uh, we had it in the 2020 budget. Now we put it in the 2020 budget. So we had to change the resolution that was attached to the grant thing. So it's no change in the budget, no extra money. It's all there be as was before. I make a motion to approve the following resolution, be it resolved that the town board approves resolution number 53 of 2020, a resolution showing that the town of Clinton included 6,000 in the 2021 budget to supplement the DASNIN grant. Is there a second? In Michael, second. Okay, ready for roll call or is it discussion? Okay, roll call, Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Whitten? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Uh, conference discussion of conference center local law. Dean? Um, talked about it before, but I think yeah, we'll it's spend a little more time here. It's, it's, it's basically because we're creating this ag event law, we're going to uh, um, re work the conference center law to address the, uh, the changes that we're making. So, um, you know, um, I would ask that, um, I don't think ever did, did you send that out to everybody, Carol? I did last uh, month. Yeah. Cause I, I don't remember, but, um, I thought, I thought we did. So, you know, uh, look at it and, uh, let's see what changes we need to make and, uh, any input from, uh, these last discussions with the uh, the ag law to see where we should address something else. 
I assume that this is not as pressing as the short-term rental and the ag events laws. Yeah, we don't have anybody applying for a conference center, so I don't, I don't expect yeah, so, that we have to get on it right away. Room. Okay, next one is um, meetings. We're gonna have two more meetings coming up. I make a motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved that the town board approves setting the date for the annual meeting for December 29th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Okay, the annual meeting is where we balance the books. Basically, that's what it is. The financial records go through all the accounting codes and balancing. Okay, uh, roll call, Oberly I, Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Witten? Aye. Motion carried. The next one is the reorganization meeting. It varies as to which day it's held in January. Uh, Ray, you're uh, muted there. Let's hit something on this keyboard. Uh, what? Okay. Uh, I make a motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved that the town board approve setting the date for the reorganization meeting for January 5th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. And this is where we uh, do all the appointments, change the salaries, appoint all the banks and newspapers, all kinds of ministrivia. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Any discussion? Roll call, Oberly, aye. Cunningham? Aye. Giuliano? Aye. Dean Michael? Aye. Witten? Aye. Motion carried. Next one is, uh, this is, we didn't know until recently, recently being like within the last week that the Association of Towns annual meeting that's traditionally held in New York City is going to be held via Zoom. And uh, I'm also the representative that goes to vote and things like that. But I also used to go and you learn stuff. So I, I sent that all out to the board people for them to consider if they want to participate or not. I make a motion to approve the following resolution. Be it resolved that the town board approves supervisor overlease Virgil, vir, virtual attendance at the Association of Towns 2021 virtual conference from February 14th, 17th, 2021 at the cost of $100. Is there a second? In Michael, second. Any more discussion? Yeah, I mean, it's so cheap. I would basically kind of recommend that we all do it. Well, whoever wants to, just let me know. I sent it on the email. And we'll coordinate it and we'll use the credit card. I mean, are they going to be doing um, the breakout sessions with all the different uh, venues like they did? Yeah, well, they, you actually. It's been 13 years more, since I went to one, so. You have one more month after the close date. So it would be March, April 7th, no, March 17th to take your classes if you don't take them on those two days. So, so you, can, you can view the videos. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they're online. Yeah, I would want to do it. Yeah, so I mean, I I sent you all the information yesterday or today. I lost track because I just got it. Okay, roll call vote. Oberly, aye. Cunningham, aye. Giuliano, aye. Dean Michael, aye. Witten, aye. Motion carried. Okay, Witten, you got a statement here? Yeah, sorry. Hold on. Um. I received an email from Brennan Carney, our county legislator, and she wanted me to read a statement for her. Um, Slate Quarry Road has long been a dangerous passage through Clinton and Rhinebeck. I have worked hard with local residents, town officials, and the county to find solutions to its hazards. I'm pleased to share this update. A safety assessment of County Route 19 Slate Quarry Road was concluded in 2019. The Dutchess County Department of Public Works reviewed this assessment and explored options to help mitigate concerns. Although the COVID pandemic has caused delays, the department has pursued possible remedies and remains diligent in their efforts. An engineering survey of the roadway topography was commissioned and is near completion. 
Dutchess County Department of Public Works recently announced resurfacing of two and a half miles of Slate Quarry Road. This project resurfaced the roadway with new high friction asphalt from Zipfeldberg Road to Center Road. The existing pavement has lost some of its friction characteristics, which creates safety issues. The new high friction asphalt addresses those issues. New high reflectivity signage will also be installed to improve driver awareness and safety. Dutchess County DPW continues its efforts to improve safety. Regarding motorists traveling at excessive speeds, at my request, the Dutchess County Sheriff's Office has increased patrols. I will continue to push for safer driving conditions for both Clinton and Rhinebeck. Um, I also had one other thing I wanted to add that was not here. Um, recently, I, uh, I know several people that have come down with COVID recently, um, and all of them got it by attending a party uh, against all recommendations. So I wanna commend Todd Martin for the measures that they're taking in the highway department. And I just wanna say that I consider everybody who lives in Clinton my neighbor and I care about all my neighbors. Um, so please wear your masks. I know the holidays are coming up and everybody wants to go to these parties, but I think we gotta skip it this year and please keep us all safe. It affects every one of us. Um, so follow the recommendations. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, now we go into resignation appointments. There are no resignations. Appointments. Chris? All right, so um, need to make a, we have a, uh, as Todd, Todd talked about, bringing in a uh, part-time uh, person uh, as a backup, or as we say, on-call person, uh, if there's an issue to come in here. Um, so I'm going to make a motion that we approve uh, so make a motion to approve the temporary appointment of Tom O'Brien on a call, uh, on call basis from December 8th, 2020 to March 8th, 2021 uh, at the uh, rate of pay for 1750. If he's driving a non CDL truck and $20 an hour for driving a CDL truck. Um, in discussion, he is being appointed as a backup driver in case of illness. Uh, is there a second? I mean, yeah, no. second. Okay. Any more discussion? Uh, just to point one other thing before uh, Todd was telling me today that he has been a employee in the past for mm -hmm. several years uh, with the highway department. So he has experience with the town roads and town equipment. Okay. Roll call. Oberly, aye. Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Whitten. Aye. Motion carried. He's hired. Okay. Warrant, Dean. I make a motion to approve the following resolution. Be resolved. The town board approves the December 8th <coughs> general fund warrant vouchers number 540 through 586, totaling $133,921.18. Eighteen cents and the December eighth, twenty twenty highway fund warrant vouchers number two hundred and fifty five through two hundred and seventy seven, totaling twenty eight thousand two hundred ninety six dollars and eighty four second. Is that a second? Juliano second. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call. Oberly I Cunningham. Aye. Juliano. Aye. Dean. Aye. Whitten. Aye. Motion carried. Motion to move funds. This is in an effort to keep the accounts balanced so we don't overspend any account. I make a motion that the town board approves the following resolution. Be it resolved that the town board approves resolution number 54 of 2020, a motion to move funds at the December 8th, 2020 town board meeting. Is there a second? Dean Michael, second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call, Overly aye, Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean. Aye. Whitten. Aye. Motion carried. Supervisor's report. This is the financial record for the expenditures for year to date and last month. I make a motion that the town board approves the November 2020 supervisor's report. Is there a second? In Michael, second. Any discussion? Roll call. Ober, <clears throat> Oberly I, uh, Cunningham. Aye. Giuliano. Aye. Dean. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. 
Any other business before the board? I make a motion that the town board adjourns the meeting. Is there a second? Hey, I just got one, uh, two things quick here. Um, there was uh, that high friction that uh, Councilman Witten was talking about. Um, there was, first thing this morning, before seven o'clock, we had a rollover auto accident on Slate Quarry coming down the hill. And once again, the town of Clinton Highway Department was out between six and seven o'clock this morning. Um, and we sanded and salted that hill for them. Um, the state police doing five miles an hour um, coming down that hill, just about slid into the back of North Dutchess Paramedics Ambulance. Um, so on request of the New York State Police, we did salt the new section that the county just resurfaced with this high friction stuff. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure that this high friction is going to work um, as of yet. I know it's fresh and new, but I'm not 100% convinced that this is going to work. Um, I'm going to write letters to the county on this when they redid those uh, sections on our town roads where we intersect with them. For example, uh, Mountain View Road, there's a, a big dip now coming into that intersection. Lake Drive coming in there with the campers and stuff. We just had a camper come in uh, a couple days ago and they ripped the bottom jack off the back of their camper. So, I mean, the county's trying to do everything and anything to, to prevent this, but in the same token, it's also affecting our town roads in that section. Um, as far as plowing and sanding out to those intersections, like I said, Lake Drive, uh, Bartle Circle. I've already been in contact with uh, Bob Balkine, the commissioner, and Gary Cooper, the uh, superintendent for Dutch County Highways. Um, I'm trying to wait for a call back or a meeting with them on site to uh, explain to these people, you know, our issues coming out to the town roads. It's nice that they're trying to do this high friction. I'm all for safety and everything on that road. I know it's treacherous and dangerous, but I'm looking out for our intersections coming out because they're just worried about the county road and not our town roads. I'm worried about our town roads coming out to the county roads. So that's gonna be an issue there that we're trying to uh, rectify with the county. Um, just to let everybody know. Lake. What What's that? That? I thought they were supposed to fix Lake. I thought so. We wrote letters to them and I haven't heard back and I've got two phone calls into Bob Balkine, uh, the commissioner and Gary Cooper, the superintendent of highway for the county and I've not heard back from them yet. I'm gonna wait and see a uh, little while longer here and then uh, we're going to take action or something because those dips coming off with our plow trucks coming out there we're going to be ripping that up uh, very very proficiently coming out to those intersections to push off and to, to back up and come back into our roads it's it's going to either tear our trucks up or tear their roads up and I'm not looking forward to tearing our trucks up. I will not tear our trucks up over that. We'll push the snow out to the county intersection and try to do our best to get it off the road but I'm not going to be tearing our trucks off because of the county's mistake or diligence of uh, our consideration to put our town roads off of those uh, county roads. I mean, it's just not economical or feasible for us to be replacing trucks just because of the county's mistakes or not looking at for our best interest coming off of their, their road. Um, the minute this meeting wraps up, I'm going to be jumping into another Zoom meeting with Brennan. Um, can I give her your contact information so she can talk to you about this? She's had some success with the Department of Public Works getting them to do things. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. And also, I just one last thing. Um, the two new highway trucks are in. Um, they're operational now. Uh, we're just waiting for the plates back from DMV, but we have insurance on to them. Training's been uh, done with them and stuff, and I'm looking forward to uh, putting those out on the road for the taxpayers to see. And I'd like to thank all five board members and Carol Jean Mackin and uh, Melissa for all the help and uh, support for these uh, trucks and for the highway department. I greatly appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Thanks, sir. I got a comment about this uh, friction surface on the road. That's been there to take care of water, not ice. And I think this morning we had a coating of ice. And what that does is it just fills it in and becomes a skating rink. So Absolutely. you got to remember that it's not a cure-all for all conditions. It's only predicated on using it for rain or water, fog or whatever, that kind of condition, not snow and ice. So I just make that as a comment. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so let me go back and say, I make a motion that the town board adjourns the meeting. Is there a second? Second. 
Roll call, Oberly I, Cunningham. Aye. Juliano. Aye. Dean Michael. Aye. Witten. Aye. Motion carried. End of the meeting. See you down on the 29th. Well, everybody have a good holiday. Happy holidays, yep. everyone. Thank Happy you. holidays. Be safe. You too. Thank you.